So today I'm hosting Anne Applebaum, writer and a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. And we will be talking about the war in Ukraine, its geopolitical consequences, the future of Russia, and about the liberal decline and rise of authoritarianism in Europe. Anne Applebaum is a staff writer for The Atlantic and the Pulitzer Prize winning historian. She is also a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the Agora Institute. From 1988 to 1991, Anne covered the collapse of communism as the Warsaw correspondent of The Economist magazine and The Independent newspaper. She has also worked as a Washington Post columnist for 15 years. Over time, her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the Guardian, and many others. Anne's first book, Between East and West, Across the Borderlands of Europe, was published in 1994, describing her journey across Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine just before the breakup of the Soviet Union. In the meantime, she published three more books, the latest being Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism, which became New York Times bestseller. So, and Putin has shown his aggressive tendencies towards other ex-Soviet republics much before the full-blown aggression against Ukraine in February last year. Uh, in 2008, when Russia attacked Georgia, in 2014 already with Ukraine, uh, were we able to prevent 2022 from happening? And if yes, how? The obvious answer is that we might have been able to deter Russia. Um, deterrence means that we would have had to invest in the Ukrainian army, um, invest in the kind of diplomacy designed to um, make Russia understand that we would defend Ukraine, um, all of which we didn't do. And there are many different people who are responsible for this for different reasons. Um, the Obama administration thought of Ukraine as a European problem. Um, the Trump administration was not very interested in the sovereignty of Ukraine and, in fact, tried to use the, um, some, some money for Ukrainian weapons as a, as a sort of blackmail tool to extort um, President Zelensky. Um, and European countries, you know, particularly Germany, but also others, were convinced that any investment in the Ukrainian army would be seen as a provocation. Um, and I think now, with hindsight, you know, it's clear that we should have invested, we should have made clear that we would fight back and that that might have prevented the war. And talking about the geopolitical consequences of the war in Ukraine, you said more than once that it's a war that would change Europe forever. And in this context, many talk about the new security guarantees for Ukraine, but also for our entire continent. So, and how will this war end? So I can't tell you how it will end because the end is going to depend on what happens in, you know, on the battlefield. And that will that will determine the shape of the ending. Um, you know, there right now, the Russians have been asked if they're, you know, through private channels, if they're interested in negotiating and they say no. Um, so they still believe that they can conquer all of Ukraine. Um, and the Ukrainians still want to defend their country and make sure that it continues to exist. So right now there isn't there isn't a clear way it, it ends. Um, the, the the most obvious way and the um, you know the most the, the way the way it could end in a, some definitive way would be for Ukraine to defeat Russia. And defeat can look in, in different you know there are different ways in which that could happen. But in any way, convince Russia to accept the idea that the war was a mistake. Um, once the Russian ruling class becomes convinced that the war is a mistake, then the war is, a sec is effectively over. Um, and so what needs to happen militarily is the Ukrainians need to, to convince that. And you're going to see um, over the next six months, you will see, maybe even sooner than that, you will see um, a Ukrainian attempt at a counteroffensive. You will see Ukrainians using new kinds of weapons. Um, and it may be that through that we get to the moment when um, there could be an end to the war. But the, the end to the war is a requires a sort of political and psychological change in Moscow. I mean, it's 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 Moscow that will determine when the when and how the war ends.
In the EU, at the same time, uh, we see a growing difference between Poland, Baltic states on the one hand, and the Western part, in particular France and Germany. The Western unity still holds vis-à-vis -vis this war, but many predict the cracks in the future. And Hungary apart, the war in Ukraine has indeed for the moment united the West. Um, but as it continues, uh, patience in these Western parts is weathering. Do you think that the war in, the Ukraine, in Ukraine, if it continues, uh, will it weaken the EU unity? So first of all, I mean, I think there are more nuances, you know, than this kind of East-West division would describe. Um, first of all, I do think there have been very, really important changes in Germany. Um, you know, really quite monumental for Germany to stop receiving gas from Russia and to close down the gas pipelines. Um, this, you know, something th people didn't think was going to be possible before the war. Um, you know, I, th I think mentally the Germans have also begun to change. You know, Germany is like this huge oil super tanker, and, you know, it only moves very, very slowly. But, you know, as it slowly begins to move, um, you see the Germans beginning to talk in a different way and to, and to be able to understand security in a different way. So, so I think they, I think that that is true. And then, of course, in Eastern Europe, there are some more divisions. I mean, you hinted at one of them. There's obviously a big division between Hungary and Poland who are united on many things but are not united on this. Um, and so it, it's not really an East-West um, division exactly. Um, and because of Poland's other arguments with the EU and because Poland has been so um, such a difficult EU member over the last several years, um, I don't really see Poland having some kind of leadership role there either for the moment. Um, uh, that, you know, that maybe that could change in the future, but not, not, not right now. So I'm not sure that the fundamental divisions in the EU are really there. I mean, um, and I would also say that the country whose attention really matters here is actually the United States, um, because one of the other things that's become clear out of this war was that Europeans were not really prepared to fight a long war. They didn't really have the ammunition stocks or the weapon stocks to do so. Um, you know, their German tanks were, you know, in, in different pieces and broken down or what, you know, whatever, you know, you've heard, you've heard the stories, I'm sure. Um, and so the, it, as it turned out, the only country that was really prepared, had a prepared military was America. And so it's really the question is whether America has the willpower for the war. Um, my guess is that the Biden administration does. Um, they've invested a lot of political capital in helping the Ukrainians. Um, Biden himself has been to Kiev, you know, first visit of an American to president to a war zone not controlled by the United States, I think, ever. Um, and so it's very important for them to, um, it's very important for them to, 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 to have a positive outcome. Um, and so, you know, certainly until the next U.S. election, I'm pretty sure that um, the U.S. will continue to back Ukraine. I mean, as I said, of course, Americans, like everybody else, want the war to end. Um, but the war can only end when, as I've, as I've already said, when the Russians understand that it was, you know, that it needs to end. <laughs> Um, the war is a war of aggression. You know, it ends when the Russians go home. You know, so there, you know, there's not going to be an occupation of Moscow. Nobody's fighting Russia. There's no invasion of Russia. Um, you know, this is an invasion of Ukraine that has to be reversed. Um, and that, I think, you know, it, I think the Americans are prepared to wait, wait that out for the moment. So I'm, I'm kind of less worried about divisions in, in Europe. And I'm, you know, my, my main concern is opinion in Washington and the United States. I mean, unfortunately... Um, you know, much as some European leaders, including, you know, now famously Macron, would like there to be a European defense um, that, you know, with, with a community, with status, with the, that's able to cooperate together and work together. That's not really the case yet. You know, it doesn't, it exists in theory, it doesn't exist in practice. So in practice, what matters is NATO, and therefore what matters is the American commitment to this war. And right now, I don't see that changing. Thank you. So maybe to move to another topic um, somehow connected, I really greatly enjoyed reading your book, The Twilight of Democracy. And um, there you discuss and explain why great numbers of people in our societies turn against democracies nowadays. You, you quote uh, Karen Stenner 
a behavioral economist who began researching personality traits two decades ago and who has argued that about a third of the population in any country has what she calls an authoritarian predisposition. And as our own Western Balkan security barometer uh, published in January this year that we do on the annual basis showed, 8.2% of the respondents stated that Serbia needs an authoritarian regime, as opposed to 41% who favor democracy. But as many as 30.3% of the respondents said that while democracy is better suited for Serbia, the country needs a firm hand at this moment in time. So is, does this situation look comparable to you, like in Poland and other Eastern European states, and how to reverse this process, how to make the population uh, support democracy and believe in democracy more? Um, so first of all, I don't think this is an East European problem. I think it's a you know international problem. Um, you could you could probably find maybe not thirty percent, but you could find um, high numbers supporting either openly supporting autocracy or de facto supporting politicians who are autocratic in the United States. So I, I don't think this is anything to do with being East European. Um, you know, in Poland, the ruling party has some 30% of the, the, the vote. It seems, you know, and that seems to be about the same number. And this is a, an autocratic party that seeks to change the rules in order to keep itself in power. Um, you know, in, in, in many other countries, you can also find some, at least some percentage of the population that feels the same way. I mean, we know that the predisposition for autocracy goes up in moments when people feel there are dramatic changes, when there are big divisions, um, when people feel very strong polarization, um, and also when they feel a threat. And of course, we're now at a moment when some, possibly not Serbia, but certainly um, Poland and other countries in Europe do feel the encroaching military threat, and they feel a threat from Russia. Um, and so I, I do think it's, I think it's a kind of permanent part of, um, of the political landscape. Um, how to change it is a long conversation. Um, there is a, um, you know, there, it's true that d democratic politicians and um, people who, 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 you know, which, by which I don't mean left wing, I mean centrist or, or could center right or center left politicians who want to live in democracy, um, um, probably need to think more about that 30% what they're afraid of, um, what's the language that can be used to reach them, um, what's the best way of campaigning in order to reach them, what's the source of that anxiety. Um, sometimes, it's, um, sometimes it's economic, sometimes it's social or demographic, um, and finding ways of speaking to that cohort are important. I mean, I think in a lot of countries, I know this is true of Poland, maybe it's true of Serbia as well, you can tell me, the subject of democratic education and civic education was really not taken serious or not treated with any importance after the political transitions. Um, and, you know, the, the, for example, the value of an independent judiciary um, wasn't, you know, wasn't reinforced. People didn't understand why it, why it mattered. Um, and then I think, you know, we're all living in a world where um, independent press and media find it very hard to survive economically and for financial reasons. And finding new forms of support or new forms, even of communication, whether even if that it, if it might not look like a newspaper, if it might look like um, you know community websites where people can exchange information or find uh, verified information in different ways. Um, beginning to think about how to pull people together that way is another another big political project. I mean. Generally speaking, um, you know, we all took democracy for granted. You know, we didn't think it was something that needed to be worked on all the time. But it, as it turns out, it requires this very high level of civic engagement. Um, and, and that's something that really almost every democracy could use. So uh, maybe just two more questions uh, before the end. Uh, we observe... Um, formerly anti-communist democratic political forces, Poland, Hungary, elsewhere, become illiberal authoritarians. And at the beginning of your book, Twilight of Democracy, describing a party you threw at the end of the previous millennium, 31st of December, 99, you tell a story of a group of your Polish friends. 
as you call them, and I quote, free market liberals, classical liberals, maybe Thatcherites, and how they became conservatives, some even conspiracy theorists and right-wing authoritarians. So are the liberals of those uh, times, previous times, 10 years before, to blame for any of the calamities in Central and Eastern Europe these last years? And maybe the last question uh, that you can connect to this one, if you were able to turn back the clock 10 years before that party, 1989, what might you have advised differently? Looking back over the, you know, talking about the mistakes made in 1989 and the 1990s is difficult in some ways because it was an experimental moment when nobody really knew what would work, you know, what would succeed. And if you measure, I mean, if you just look at Poland alone, and, you know, I, Serbia may be a completely different story, but if you look at Poland alone, by the terms of what people expected in, you know, 1991 or 1992, Poland has been an unbelievable success. I mean, unbelievable, you know, triple the level of GDP, um, you know, the living standards rising through all classes, all social classes, you know, throughout the country. Um, you know, so if you, if you, you know, things that nobody really expected before that. Um, and most, and much of what has disappointed people about the country and what has been, um, um, which is which is which has enabled the sort of culture wars that have provoked the right hasn't I mean th and again this is specific to Poland so please tell me if it's different for other countries um, most of it is not economic um, most of it is kind of cultural and social um, you know it was the encounter with um, you know the values of of Western Europe which were different from what Poles expected um, it was the um, you know, the proliferation of, um, uh, you know, many different kinds of news and opinions and arguments and what it created a kind of cacophony that people found unsettling. Um, in some cases, it was the conflict of democracy itself, you know, the fact that people were yelling at each other that bothered people. Um, and, you know, ge generally, um, I think the you know, in some ways, the successes of capitalism or the successes of economics created the sense of loss. So people, you know, the speed of change meant that the kind of world that people grew up in, you know, the, you know, the, the communities that they knew when, you know, 30 or 40 years ago had disappeared or been changed. Um, and people regretted that. And it's really that sense of loss and disappointment that I think explains um, the appeal of the far right rather than rather than anything else. Um, so even if people were economically better off, you know, they felt this loss of community and so on. Um, and so maybe, um, you know, maybe one could have, I don't know, you know, thought harder about the preservation of certain kinds of community values or the um, investing more in in small towns and and in um, you know, in provincial life, maybe one could have thought more about, you know, better communication and education. Um, you know, there are a lot of things one could think back to do. But I, but I, I, you know, I have to say that because people were starting from scratch in the 90s and, you know, didn't really, you know, there was, you know, it, felt, it all felt very experimental. Um, I find it hard to blame particular people for mistakes. I mean, you can, you can point to particular things. I mean, the Polish government between 2007 and 2014 made a mistake in um, in raising the retirement age without consulting people or not. And this is, of course, a, something that Macron has just run into the same problem in France. So you can point to individual problems like that. I mean, um, but it's it's hard to criticize the whole process because it was conducted almost in the dark. As I said, the feeling of loss that that rapid change created was. I think hard to foresee, but you know, I guess looking back on it, maybe that should have been anticipated, and people should have thought more about um, not just the economic impact of the changes, but the cultural and social impact. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you.